Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so this is based on joint works with uh, Ido Bentov, uh, Tal Moran, and Guy Ziskin. So this workshop is about secure computation. It's like the most general problem in cryptography. And uh, on the first day, we saw that this is really moving fast from theory to practice, the major research effort in cryptography right now. And uh, people are actually looking at implementation and systems issues in this, uh, in this area. So this talk is also going to be about uh, Bitcoin, which is uh, a decentralized digital currency that provides some level of anonymity. It's one of the reasons why it became very famous. And it's also relatively widely adopted. There's a lot of recent research activity. Like This is one of the few Bitcoin talks in this workshop. Uh, Bitcoin is, also, is supposed to securely implement, uh, implement a bank. And uh, it can actually enable uh, a wide variety of transactions because of, uh, because of expressive power. Like it supports uh, Bitcoin scripts and time locks, which allow a wide range of applications. Uh, some of these applications are uh, like lottery gambling auctions, so these are happening on the Bitcoin ecosystem. Currently, these are done using a trusted party, but these are already uh, this is stuff that's happening in Bitcoin. So this talk is about uh, enhancing uh, secure computation. So uh, Secure computation is great, but what are the issues with, uh, with traditional secure computation? So here's like a partial list. Uh, perhaps the, most, the biggest problem is, uh, is fairness in the presence of a dishonest majority. What we know is that it's, uh, it's probably impossible uh, in, in the setting, like even simple tasks like uh, fair coin tossing is, uh, is impossible. So people have started looking at like several workarounds, uh, et cetera. Uh, another issue is like resource fairness. So here, um, uh, nobody gets the output uh, of the computation, so it's kind of fair in the traditional sense. But still, uh, an honest party wastes resources going, like say, until the end of the computation, and is expecting to get the output, but the other party has aborted, let's say. So it has wasted computation and without without even getting uh, the final output. So this is uh, this is some kind of fairness that that we'll be interested. In. Another thing is uh, protocol completion. So this is something uh, secure computation in general cannot guarantee, uh, especially in like multi-stage reactive computation. So even if you have like ideal fair functionality, you can only do it for like one stage of the computation. You can get the outputs, but how do you enforce that parties carry on to the next stage? So that is something which is which is not clear. The obvious uh, other issue with uh, traditional MPC is that it does not really handle cash. Like cash distribution is. Uh, uh, it, it just involves like um, uh, bit strings and tuning machines, so there's no uh, framework in place for this. And obviously, this makes it like kind of hard to uh, uh, you know m make M use MPC for like real applications such as like auctions, poker, stock markets, like Chalanjit was talking about uh, yesterday. And uh, the next issue, perhaps, is uh, malicious compilers for MPC. So here. Um, uh, there has been a lot of uh, tremendous progress uh, in the last few years, but still the overhead is kind of large, and uh, this is also one of the issues which, is, uh, uh, which we will try to uh, you know, enhance in this, uh, in this talk. So um, what we, the way in which you're going to enhance uh, secure computation is by looking at some kind of a unified model, which is called uh, the penalty model. So in a broad uh, way, like any deviating party, the adversary, if he deviates from the protocol, maybe it's fairness, maybe it's some protocol completion, uh, any type of issue, then we force that the adversary is going to pay like a, like a monetary penalty to the, to the honest party. So in some sense, both parties are starting with some money, and then uh, if something goes wrong, then uh, uh, the honest party is compensated with, uh, with money. So obviously, uh, one main requirement is that uh, we never want honest parties to lose money. And uh, the bad guys, uh, well, they should lose money if they deviate, and the money that is lost should go to the honest party. Right? So uh, in all the enhancements that we are looking at, like fairness, resource usage, protocol completion, cash distribution, MPC, uh, malicious MPC, so here we are going to adopt this penalty model. So the adversary can deviate, like for example, in fairness, he can deviate, he can learn the output and abort. But then we'll make sure that uh, the honest party is compensated according to this model. So, uh, so the type of applications that we, are, uh, that we will enable would be like some uh, fair versions of lottery, where fairness is in this sense, like in the penalty model. You can get the output and you can, you can abort the computation but the honest party will get compensated. Right? So we can enable like fair versions of lottery, po poker, auctions, markets, and so many other things. 
Um, so one way to look at our applications is, uh, you know, you can look at them as like complex smart contracts with uh, with this like penalty thing in in the contract. Uh, plus, uh, we we will enable this like uh, added security and privacy guarantees. Uh, and what we will mainly show in this talk is that how how to build these like very uh, complex contracts from from very simple contracts. So the type of uh, there are several notions of simplicity one might be interested in. And uh, the notion that we will look at is like some kind of stateless uh, contracts. So these contracts don't, the simple contracts won't depend upon other contracts. And uh, even in a multi-party setting, these contracts will only involve like two parties, but still they will allow you to realize these comp complex contracts uh, in a, in a multi-party setting. So this is the type of, uh, this is one way to interpret our results. So this is the, uh, the simple um, the simple contract that we will be using throughout this talk. Uh, so this is the claim or refund transaction functionality. So there are, uh, so this involves only two parties and it's uh, stateless in the following sense. So there is a sender and a designated receiver. The sender is going to deposit some money to this functionality, uh, and then it is going to specify some uh, some circuit fee and a time bound tau. <laughs> now, uh, the receiver has an option to either claim it or, or not claim it, but if it has to claim, if it claims this money, then it has to do so within, uh, within the specified time-bound tau, and it has to produce a witness T that satisfies fee. So if it does it within the time-bound tau, then it can, then it can get the money. Uh, but if it does not do anything, uh, then the money is just returned back to the sender. Right? But if it does claim the witness, then the witness is, uh, is revealed to all parties. So, so I said it involves only two parties, but now I'm saying the witness is revealed to all parties. So this is because uh, the way this, uh, this is just like an ideal functionality version of this, uh, uh, of this uh, contract. In reality, if you, if you implement it over Bitcoin, then uh, this whole contract is going to be there in the public ledger, and everybody can see if, if something was claimed. The transactions will be, will be public to all parties. So this is okay. So, uh, so why this functionality is uh, very interesting to us is because, uh, well, this can be efficiently realized uh, in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin provides the, uh, you know, it allows uh, transaction to be you know, redeemed depending on like scripts, and it also supports like time logs, which which can capture this notion of time. And what is cool about this uh, claim or refund transaction functionality is that we just abstract uh, this particular thing which is given by Bitcoin. Uh, but now it can be, uh, it allows for realization in and across different models. So you can, you can look at a different altcoin, uh, but as long as it supports this uh, claim or refund transaction functionality, you can still use our protocols. You can also use this, uh, if, if like PayPal, for example, decides to, decides to implement this transaction functionality, you can still run our protocols as long as you trust PayPal. So uh, some of the efficiency metrics that we, we'll, yeah. Stand is open to a certain party or for the public? It's open to a designated receiver. So it's like for one receiver. So this is, uh, so everybody knows who the two parties are. So the efficiency metrics that we will be interested in when realizing these complex contracts from simple contracts are uh, the standard ones, like uh, you know, you want like computation complexity, communication complexity, or round complexity. It depends on uh, on, on the specific application that we are interested in. Uh, the other complexity measure, which is kind of new and unique to this uh, uh, to our problem, is uh, the so-called validation complexity. So this is uh, this actually tries to capture the complexity of the scripts. So in the previous slide with the claim or refund transaction, so this is the complexity of fee. So why this complexity is important is because uh, for the transaction to be validated in the Bitcoin network, kind of every miner has to uh, accept this transaction. So they have to essentially run fee and see whether uh, the witness actually corresponds to fee. So if your, trans if your validation complexity is low, then obviously it's, uh, you'll have faster validation. You'll also have a reduced load on, on the Bitcoin network. And in the future, it's possible that as your, uh, as your complexity keeps growing, you know, at some point, miners might decide to levy some kind of a transaction fee on, your, uh, on the transactions. So, it's, so, so in general, like reducing this validation complexity is an important, uh, is an important uh, the other complexity measure that we might be interested in some of our applications is this optimistic complexity. Uh, here you kind of typically expect parties to behave honestly and you optimize for this, uh, not necessarily for worst case. Uh, okay.
So before we go into the construction, some practical issues uh, about uh, about the about the protocols that we design. So clearly, if you have an attack on Bitcoin and you break the claim or refund transaction functionality, our schemes are, uh, are broken. Uh, and in general, we assume that uh, whoever is uh, running our protocols, they have a good communication network. Like there's no denial of service, or you have like some workarounds around this. Because yes. On, on the first point, do you, have we thought about doing, doing something so if Bitcoin is broken, then the fairness only is broken, but otherwise the protocol is remains secure with the border, for example? Uh, yeah, it will be. Uh, you will see it in the construction. So it will be. That will be the case. So but we don't give like the penalty guarantees anymore. It will just be secure with the border. Uh, right, so we want uh, we assume good communication network because in our protocols we'll start penalizing if someone's supposed to supposed to do something and he's not doing it. So if it's because uh, if it's some problem with the network and he's not able to do it, then he will start losing money. And uh, for some of our constructions, we'll also need uh, uh, very slightly more complicated scripts than the than the scripts that are currently supported in Bitcoin. There are many opcodes which are blacklisted. So uh, our, our scripts do not, uh, not all our protocols run directly on Bitcoin. But uh, there are some proposals for all coins with uh, Turing complete scripts. And uh, if, they, if they happen, then, then you can run our protocols on them. Or alternatively, you can contact like, some specific mining pool and ask them to mine your transactions, uh, and you pay increased transaction fees. So that is also an option. <coughs> Uh, constructions will use uh, heavy crypto in the sense that they'll use garbage circuits, snarks, and NISICs, and uh, but uh, the efficiency of these uh, primitives are expected to improve in the future. So, so in the rest of the talk, I will uh, I will talk about the enhancements to secure computation. I'll briefly describe the problem uh, and and the main results. For the first, uh, for fairness, I will be describing the result in slightly more detail. For the rest, it'll probably be just a slide. Of or two. So uh, the first issue is fairness in secure computation. So, uh, so fairness in general is like exemplified by this uh, fair exchange or contract signing problem. So where uh, two parties want to sign a contract, but neither party wants to go first because uh, you might send the contract, but the other party might just take the contract and run away. Uh, so this problem and fair coin tossing and several like fair secure computation problems in general they are probably impossible. And so we can. Uh, so researchers have looked at several workarounds. So, so in this particular line of work, we'll be looking at uh, the workaround in the penalty model. So here uh, we allow the adversary to abort after learning the output, but uh, if it does so, then it will pay penalties to uh, to all other parties. So I'm just going to summarize uh, some of the results that we know. Uh, also giving credit to to prior work. So uh, it was a, a, a protocol for two-party lottery by Back and Bento, uh, and also a protocol by uh, Stefan Zimbowski's group at the University of Warsaw uh, for multi-party. So these are the first protocols, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, which started using a penalty model and tied it to Bitcoin. Uh, following this, there was a two-party secure computation protocol by Stefan's group, and uh, concurrently, uh, there was a multi-party secure computation protocol in, the, in this claim or refund transaction uh, hybrid model. And the validation complexity of this is like independent of the, of the function that you're evaluating. It's just going to be some hash verification, depending on the output length. So uh, in subsequent works, there have been like efficiency improvements uh, by using slightly more complex contracts. So we are going to uh, show a protocol using like simple contracts, claim or refund, but you can use complex contracts and uh, and obtain some efficiency improvements, mainly in the round complexity. So just to get a flavor of how we uh, model uh, some of the complex contracts, so we model them just as like ideal functionalities, uh, and but now they are going to start dealing with uh, money in some sense, right? So, uh, so the way we capture money is just like using some very minimal model. You just have coins which don't, um, uh, who, which are different from bit strings in the sense that uh, coins change ownership when you send from when one party sends it to the other party. So this is the slide for like uh, the contract for secure computational penalties. If you ignore the stuff in green, you just get like standard secure computation. So everybody submits their inputs, and the functionality returns the output to the simulator, and the simulator has a chance whether to. Uh, uh, whether to abort or to continue. 
uh, when we for for secure computation penalties, now we ask everybody to deposit some uh, some coins. So the coins deposited by the honest parties are going to be returned to them. Uh, and the simulator, if we deposit a like, sufficient number of coins, namely h times q, where q is the penalty amount and h is the number of honest parties, that is like sufficient to pay penalties just in case the simulator aborts. Right? So, uh, so now, um, uh, if if it if it submitted sufficient number of coins, then it has a chance to look at the output. If it did not, then uh, then the output is sent to all parties. Uh, it can look at the output and decide to abort. In which case, uh, the penalties are distributed. If it continues to, I mean, if it decides to continue, then uh, it gets its deposit back. So this is the way. This is just a flavor of uh, the ideal functionality representation of our. Of, yeah. What's the relation between Q and so it depends. Like uh, it's a parameter, so you can write a theorem saying that uh, d should be so many, so much times q. For our protocols, it will be something like n times q, where n is the number of parties. But this is some parameter that you can improve. And for x not equal to h times q. Uh, yeah. So I just mean like x less than h q. So we are not allowed to abort if that's yeah, so uh, I mean, in the actual protocol, an abort will happen somewhere before the, the simulator extracts the coins. So this is just like a high level picture. So there's some details which are missing. But. So, functionality uh, is it common for functionality to use number of honest parties inside? I've never seen a functionality like that. Is it even within UC framework? Yeah, so you have the simulator and the number of. Uh, yeah. Uh, it gets from the simulator all the corrupt inputs, and it has to get for, from the other parties, each other party, for other inputs. So, uh, so we are going to show how to realize uh, this uh, uh, fair uh, secure computation from uh, simple contracts, right? So, uh, first uh, starting point is to reduce uh, fast secure computation to fair reconstruction. So, this is like a general paradigm which is used in several previous works. So, the, in the first step, we are going to run like some unfair secure computation, which is going to uh, compute the output of f. It is going to additively secret share among n parties. Then, it's going to compute commitments on each of these shares. Uh, it's going to make all the commitments public, but the ith d commitment is made public only to the ith party. So note that this is an unfair step, uh, is an unfair secure computation, and the adversary can abort during this step. But uh, it will not learn any of the, uh, it will not learn the outputs because at least one of the shares is hidden, uh, because the uh, because there is at least one honest party. So what we need to do is now a protocol for fair reconstruction. Everybody reveals their shares, and uh, in, in a way such that if, if an adversary does not reveal the share, then you have to uh, penalize uh, penalize them. Uh, so we are going to use uh, the following notation to denote uh, a claim or refund transaction. This is the arrow notation from P1, P1 to P2. So it just means that uh, P1 makes uh, this claim or refund deposit, and P2 can claim it uh, within time tau. Uh, it, it, it can claim the money if it reveals uh, the witness T within time tau. So our protocol is going to. So after this first step, it's uh, the protocol for fair reconstruction of planet is just going to be a sequence of. Uh, it's just going to be like a sequence of these arrows, a sequence of claim, uh, claim and deposits. So note that this, uh, the FCR functionality itself does not provide any kind of simultaneity guarantee. So someone can make a deposit, the other party can abort. Someone can claim a deposit, some subsequent party can abort. And you also have to deal with malicious coalitions. So uh, just going to go uh, quickly over uh, our, our solution for this. Uh, for this problem, so this we call as the ladder protocol. So there are two uh, two phases in this protocol. Uh, the first is a roof phase where everybody makes a deposit to the last party, and uh, this can be claimed if uh, if the last party is going to produce all the all the decommitments. Then you have like a ladder step. So these all the first first phase deposits can be made simultaneously. <laughs> then in the next step, which is called the ladder, so parties take turns to make deposit, goes like one by one. Uh, in like the i step party and minus a, or let, let's just say pi is going to make a deposit to pi minus one, saying that uh, it can it can uh, take like something like i minus one times q coins if it produces the first i shares. So uh, also the it can so 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 one there are two things to note. First is that the number of uh, uh, decommitments that you need to produce like it keeps increasing. 
And also the, the penalty, uh, I mean, the deposit amount is also increasing, like Q2, Q3, Q all the way. So the reason we have, uh, we have this like, list of uh, uh, the decommitments increasing is because uh, this is just a mechanism to, provide, to prevent uh, aborts in the deposit phase. So you, you kind of know that unless all the deposits are made, parties cannot start claiming from the front and, and avoid making other deposits. And the reason this, uh, this amount goes from Q to Q so on is, uh, is to prevent parties from aborting during the claim. So now if an honest party uh, makes a claim, uh, you can kind of observe that uh, it's already, so, so for example, P2 will deposit Q, but then in the next step it can, it can get two times Q, so it's kind of already got the penalty amount, which it will lose if, uh, if Pn is going to take Q, Q coins from it. So that is like the, the high level idea. So. Um, uh, so in some sense, like at the, at the end of the, in an honest execution, so everybody is able to claim. So P1 makes produces T1 claims the money. Now P2 knows T1. It already knew T2, so it can claim uh, uh, P3's deposit, and and they keep going up. So eventually, at the end, when Pn learns the output, when Pn minus one reveals everything else, in some sense, Pn has uh, Pn will actually pay n minus one times Q coins to Pn minus one, but. If you look at it from a different angle, it's as if it has it has paid like Q coins to each of them because P n minus one would have paid like n minus two of those to P n minus two and so on. So uh, so this is our uh, our protocol for uh, fire uh, fire reconstruction of penalties from uh, from the simple uh, uh, from FCR. So next we go to like resource fairness. Uh, so here uh, I'll just give like a, a couple of examples about like the type of problems that we, uh, that, that we have looked at. So one is the problem of verifiable computation, which, I'm, which I think you, you should have heard in the, in the first talk. So here we have like a computationally weak client who's outsourcing his computation to uh, a powerful server. And uh, so we want the server to compute. Obviously, there is some incentive for the server. Namely, it's, uh, it's probably going to get some money after it performs the computation. Right. So once we introduce money, you already run into some kind of fairness issues because uh, you don't exactly know when the client is going, needs to pay the server. Right. So the client, uh, you know, if the client pays after it gets the output, if you, if you schedule the money transfer in that way, then uh, the server can compute, but the client never pays up. So the server has, com his, has wasted its resources but has not gotten paid. If you make the client pay ahead of time, then the server just has no incentive to, to perform any computation because it already got the money. Right. So, uh, so what we show in, as one of our results is, is like a fair scheme for verifiable computation where, where you don't have these like fairness issues. So the high level idea is to run some kind of a secure computation protocol to compile uh, any verifiable computation scheme into, uh, into a fair verifiable computation scheme. And here we again use only, only claim or refund transaction functionalities. Uh, and the validation complexity of a protocol is, uh, is kind of proportional to the client verification. It's just like a snark verification. And it's not, uh, it's, it doesn't depend on, on, the, on the exact function that is being computed. So that is, that is what is non-trivial about this result. So uh, next uh, uh, example for resource fairness is, uh, is private simultaneous messages. So this is something you might have heard in, in Ivan's talk yesterday. So just going back to the model, so, um, so here we have like multiple clients and one referee, and uh, the clients share some randomness. The clients are supposed to send a single message, which allows the referee to learn, uh, learn the final uh, output of the function. So we can look at a variant of this model where the referee is uh, actually paying for the output. So it's willing to pay for the output. Now, uh, the thing is, uh, it, has, it will get the output only if like, both, both the clients are sending uh, their messages. Now what happens is that the honest client will obviously compute, but the dishonest client could just deviate from the protocol. It might, it might not compute, it might send like an incorrect message. So in this case, the referee is not going to get the output, so it doesn't make any sense for, uh, for him to pay up. So, but, the honest, uh, but the honest client has kind of uh, invested a lot of computation, so this, this step could, for example, be garbling of a function, which might be, might be a pretty intensive task. So it has, it has performed a lot of computations, but all this computation is going waste because uh, the dishonest client hasn't done anything. Right? So it kind of wanna, in this setting, we would like to penalize the dishonest client for not, for not participating in the protocol. So uh, as one of our results in a, in a preliminary work, we show uh, a, a constant run solution for this particular problem. Uh, in the claim or refund uh, transaction hybrid model. So it's no longer just a one message protocol, but uh, we have like constant rounds. 
Uh, and the non-trivial part about this construction is that uh, the validation complexity is independent of uh, of the actual garbled circuits uh, of the actual function being computed. It's just proportional to the to the input length. And the communication complexity, we still manage to keep it low. It's four times semi-honest uh, Yao. So without this uh, resource fairness, you, you would get like something like just one time semi-honest Yao. But now it's, uh, it's a factor four, but you get this like resource fairness notion. Uh, our next enhancement is uh, secure protocol completion with penalties. Uh, so here we are going to um, uh, consider like reactive multi-stage computations. And uh, we would like to penalize uh, on aborts. Like every honest party who uh, should get compensated if an adversary just aborts in the middle. So one thing that I want to point out is that it does not reduce to just a non-reactive case where you have a single shot computation. Because uh, you know, fairness with penalties just works for a single stage. It does not guarantee that the next stage of computation will even start. So, uh, so we, we, have, we are faced with the challenge that uh, aborts between stages and during the stage also needs to be penalized. And uh, so this kind of a, a protocol completion uh, mechanism would, uh, would allow us to realize uh, cool applications like uh, multi-round adaptive fair exchange. So here you have uh, parties having like a lot of commodities they are willing to exchange like round by round. And what you need is like for the entire, all the rounds to be uh, uh, completed. Uh, it's adaptive in the sense that the parties can decide which commodity to, to exchange based on the exchanges that happened in the previous rounds. Uh, it can also enable some applications like mental poker where uh, you know, if, you, if you're not able to capture all the player strategies in a single shot computation, you can just look at it as a reactive computation and, and still force the, the protocol to be completed. When you talk about mental poker, so obviously uh, our, our functionality is already kind of handling, uh, handling money in some sense, so it makes sense to look at a more general notion of cash distribution where uh, where the functionality is going to take both like uh, you know regular inputs as well as uh, as well as coins, not just as a as a penalty deposit, but also as an input, and then it can uh, compute the output of the function and uh, you know redistribute the coins that were deposited depending on the output of the function. So this will obviously uh, yield I mean yield solutions to several applications like uh, like lottery, you know auctions, or poker, or stock markets, markets in general. Uh, and uh, this is the result uh, that we have about uh, about this uh, this particular primitive. So this was actually introduced by in you know, a work by Stefan et al. where they outlined uh, uh, that something like this would be very cool, and uh, and they sketched the solution in the two-party non-reactive problem uh, in a subsequent paper. Uh, in a recent work, we uh, we formalized and generalized this primitive. So what we can do now is we can handle multi-party. Uh, uh, computations and uh, it can also be like bounded reactor, so it could be it could happen in multiple stages, and the whole thing is that this is still secure. I mean, secure cash distribution with penalties. So if someone abuts in the middle, then they then they still pay up to everybody. So we can we can handle bounded reactor computation, and all of this is still done using just the claim or refund uh, transaction. Uh, the bad thing about this protocol is that uh, the validation complexity is kind of not 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 very good. It's 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 pretty high. It's, uh, it's, it's proportional to the verification of the underlying reactive MPC messages. So every MPC message will kind of uh, need to go through a claim or refund transaction. So this is very expensive. Okay. Yes. So I will, uh, will skip this slide where we do uh, where we can also monetize some very um, uh, leaky types of uh, secure computation protocols, and we can penalize deviations even there. So I'll just uh, go to the summary. Uh, so we looked at uh, a number of enhancements to, uh, to secure computation, uh, including like fairness, resource usage, protocol completion, cache distribution. And uh, the way, so what, like with these, and, uh, with these enhancements in the penalty model, so we can kind of uh, have like a more realistic solution to some applications which kind of really require fairness, like, uh, like lottery, gambling, auctions, or markets. So one way to view a result is that uh, we actually show realizations of complex contracts uh, with like increased privacy and security, but we actually uh, build these from like simple contracts which have like very low validation complexity. They are stateless. They don't depend on other contracts and they they involve only like two parties. So for future directions, uh, some of the notions like mainly like resource usage, for example, uh, we we don't have a very good formalization and also uh, formalizations of Bitcoin itself is uh, is kind of open and you can also look at like other ideal 
uh, functionalities, transaction functionalities, which can yield the same type of applications. Obviously, are there like more applications for which uh, the claim or refund transaction functional does not really help? So, so those things are open. Uh, efficiency improvements is an obvious open question. Some of our protocols, for example, the fair, uh, the fairness with penalties protocol takes like n rounds, and each round uh, is like uh, is like 10 minutes if you put it on the Bitcoin network. So, so obviously, improving the round complexity is, uh, is a great interest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you, I mean, given that this is so general, can they actually build uh, your own, uh, I don't know, kind of variant of Bitcoin, or it's kind of based on Bitcoin? I'm trying to see if it's so. So as long as you, so you only need to uh, need a cryptocurrency which. Um, uh, which supports the claim or refund transaction functionality. It could be any, like Bitcoin already supports it with some like limitations on the script size, on, on the script complexity. Uh, you, could you could build this on top of like any cryptocurrency. You can, you can also create your own currency which, which is tailor-made to specific applications. Like it can support so-and-so uh, uh, scripts, then it's, then it's still fine. You can, you can enable some applications. More questions? <coughs> okay, thank you.